We would like to welcome all of our viewers and listeners to another Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar series, and I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today's topic is IgG4 related disease. We have a great guest speaker today. Dr. Zach Wallace is a rheumatologist and clinical epidemiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Wallace is the co-director of the Rheumatology Vasculitis Program and the Rheumatology and Allergy Clinical Epidemiology Research Center at MGH. He is a member of the IgG4 RD Autoimmune Center of Excellence, which is the largest center for IgG4 RD clinical care and research in the United States. His clinical expertise is in diagnosis and management of IgG4 related disease and vasculitis. His research is focused on improving patient centered health outcomes for patients living with IgG4 related disease, vasculitis, and other systemic rheumatic disease. And now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Wallace so that he can educate us about IgG4 related disease. Thanks so much, Kathy. And thanks for the opportunity to be with you all today. I'm just gonna share my screen today um, so that we can talk a little bit about IgG4 related disease. Um, Kathy, are you able to see my screen okay? It looks great. Terrific, all right. So let's talk about IgG4 related disease. I'll give you um, some basics here. Uh, actually, on the slide here, what I've included a photo of is our IgG4 positive plasma cells in a piece of, of, of a biopsy sample from a patient, just to give you a sense of what we're looking for. And it's those part, darker stained um, things that, that show us that there's IgG4 um, in an inflammatory uh, biopsy. Um, so let me go to the next screen here. All right. So the top five things that I want you to take away from this presentation today are listed here. Um, so, and we'll go through each of these in more detail. Um, IgG4 related disease, or I'll abbreviate it IgG4 RD throughout this, is caused by an inappropriate immune response that causes inflammation and fibrosis. The second point is that this process can occur at near, in nearly any organ in our body and any anatomic site. And we'll go into a little bit of detail about what that means. There's some that are more common manifestations than others, um, but it can pop up in a variety of places. Now, a lot of folks, understandably, because of the name of the condition, associate IgG4 levels in the blood with this disease. And indeed, you know, a lot of the patients that have IgG4 related disease have high levels of IgG4 in our blood. We all have IgG4 antibodies, you know, people without this condition, people with other conditions, we all have it. It's part of our immune system. It's just that in patients with this disease, it tends to be very elevated. There are some patients in whom the level isn't that high, even though they have the disease. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means. A good piece of information to know if you if you have this condition or your providers are suspecting it is that treatment can be really effective um, for treating this, this condition. And the final point I want you to take away from today is that we're learning an incredible amount of IgG4 related disease each day. And with that, we kind of get new insights into how best to treat it and, and manage it um, to improve the outcome. Was, um, or the first point I wanted to take away was that this condition is caused by an inappropriate immune response. And what that means is that for one reason or another, if you have this disease, your immune system is sort of causing inflammation and fibrosis in areas that should. And this is a very similar process to what we see in other autoimmune diseases. And we think of, of IgG4-related disease as an autoimmune condition. What's unique about this condition is the way that it looks under the microscope is somewhat unique. We see certain patterns there in terms of the type of inflammation and fibrosis. Um, so when we are making the diagnosis of IgG4 related disease, we oftentimes try and get a biopsy. We don't always need it. We don't aren't always able to get it, but under the biopsy, we're able to see some of the findings that are really consistent with this condition. And we see a variety of different balances of fibrosis and inflammation in patients with this condition. Some patients have lesions that are more inflammatory, and some patients have lesions that are more fibrotic. And what that means when I say fibrotic is that 
it's a it's a pattern of, of cells and other changes that we see in the tissue. And fibrosis tends to be a process that's normally part of our the healing that happens in our body. If we get a cut or we have an injury somewhere like in our inside, in our lung or somewhere else, one of the body's responses to healing that is to, is to um, actually ends up in a little bit of fibrosis. Now, what's happening in this process is that in some cases, you're, we're ending up with a lot of extra fibrosis and that can make these lesions sort of hard to touch if you can imagine you were touching it. And we'll get into a little more detail about what that might mean if, when you have this condition, if you have some lesions that you actually can touch, like in your salivary glands. Um, because of what we've learned about this condition and the fact that we know that there's different types of inflammatory cells that are important and that fibrosis is there, we're sort of constantly learning more about ways that we might be able to treat this disease more effectively, even more effectively than the treatments that we have now that can work well. And so we're trying to really identify what are the targets that we need to, um, to identify treatments for that will help patients um, with this disease. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what IgG4 related disease can do when it affects the body. And so this is a figure from a paper that was published a few years ago, but I like it because I think it illustrates nicely um, what organs can be affected by IgG4 related disease. And as I mentioned, when IgG4 related disease um, is present and someone has this, what the disease tends to do is cause either a mass or some sort of inflammatory process in an affected site. And those affected sites that are sort of common are listed here. And I'll highlight a few of them. So, you know, in my practice and what a lot of my colleagues see are patients who have swelling of their salivary glands and our salivary glands are located. We have, we have several of them, but the main ones that are affected are sort of under our jaw here and on the sides of our cheek. These are the submandibular glands and these are the parotid glands. And when those are affected, what patients oftentimes notice is that they can become enlarged and it's sometimes they can be a little firm to touch. Um, Another area in the head that can be affected are our lacrimal glands, and those are actually located in the corner of our eyes. They're normally there just to make tears. They're usually very, you know, very small, not noticeable, but in this condition, they can get a little bit enlarged. Other areas that can commonly be affected are the pancreas and the biliary tract. So those are down in our abdomen. Um, normally our pancreas and our biliary tract are responsible for things that help us sort of digest food and, and other things that our body just has to do each day, like make insulin to control our blood sugar levels. And so what the disease can do there is in our pancreas, it can cause inflammation, it can cause these mass type lesions. And similarly, in our biliary tract, which is actually just a series of a lot of tubes, it can cause some inflammation there and some narrowing in those tubes. Moving a little further down, this condition can affect the kidneys. It can cause these, this sort of inflammatory process around some of our large blood vessels, like our aorta, as it goes through the abdomen or what's called the retroperitoneum, which is kind of the back part of our abdomen. Um, and it can also cause some swelling of, of lymph nodes. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of other potential sites. And some patients have manifestations elsewhere in spots that aren't listed here, um, but these are what we see most often. Well, let's move on to the next bullet point. So I, um, IgG4 um, levels in the blood are oftentimes elevated in patients with this condition, but not always. And so about 70% of patients with IgG4-related disease have elevations in their IgG4 levels in their blood. So the majority of patients do have this. But I know that can be confusing because you think that with the name IgG4-related disease, everyone should have high levels in their blood. But to be honest, we don't really know what IgG4 has to do with this disease, why it's there in the tissue, and why a lot of patients have elevated levels. So it may not be the best name, but it's the best one we got right now. So we stick with it, but just so that you know that the levels aren't always elevated. But it's important to also know that your doctor may test you for this and measure this level. And if it's elevated, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have the disease. We need to kind of do some other investigation and think about the whole case and what's going on to really make the diagnosis. Because certainly there's patients with other conditions, for instance, other types of vasculitis, who can have elevated IgG4 levels. And as I mentioned before, the role of IgG4 in this condition is not fully understood. Um, and there are some patients out there who just have an elevated level of IgG4 in their blood, and we don't really know why. So we're still learning a lot about this as well. 
All right, so the next point is that treatment can be really effective in IgG4-related disease. Now, like a lot of the conditions that, that we manage um, as rheumatologists and other clinicians who take care of patients with vasculitis and other conditions, we use a lot of steroids in our practice. You know, and while we try to avoid them because they have a lot of side effects, they can work really well. And that's true for IgG4-related disease also. Steroids are really commonly used and can be really effective. There was actually a trial done where they just looked to see whether steroids work or not. And over 90% of patients responded to steroids. Now, if you take steroids and they don't help you feel better or they don't help the condition go away, we need to either rethink the diagnosis or the other possibility is that the manifestation that you have may be in a stage that's very fibrotic and may not be very responsive to steroids. So don't be discouraged, but it's important to realize that if steroids aren't working very well and not doing what we'd expect them to, we need to kind of reevaluate things. Now, while steroids work really well, as you lower the dose or as you stop them, it's certainly possible that the IgG4-related disease can flare up again. And so we're actively trying to identify and use other medicines to prevent that. One of the medicines that we use a lot where I work um, and others as well are, are, is something called rituximab, which is used to treat a lot of other conditions, including various forms of vasculitis. And as some of you may be familiar, this is a medication that affects the B cells. That's a part of our immune system and part of the process that leads to IgG4-related disease. And rituximab can be very effective. And right now, there's actually a large trial going on to see if a medicine like rituximab that also targets B cells can work well to treat this disease and prevent flares. And the final bullet point that I wanted to share with you today is that new treatments are being evaluated every day for IgG4-related disease, and we're constantly learning new things about this condition. There's just a figure here to illustrate a little bit about what we think is going on in the immune system. And as you can see, this is a busy figure and it's somewhat complex, but it's just meant to highlight that there's a lot of different cells and a lot of different factors that we think that are contributing to this condition. So there's a lot we need to do to better understand this, but the good news is that we're already testing different therapies that target different parts of this process to see what might be best for treating this condition. So I hope that was helpful. And I think now we'll move on to a question and answer. Um, but hopefully this, these are some nice points that you can keep in mind as you um, talk to your clinicians and providers and think about this condition.